look, I want a small government, but I want a government to be able to do what it's supposed to do at the time it's supposed to do it. Okay, today I have the pleasure of speaking with Professor Alex Tabrock, who's the Bartley J. Madden Chair of Economics at the Mercator Center and a professor of economics at George Mason University. And of course, he's the co-author of the popular Marginal Revolution blog with Professor Tyler Cowan, who I've also had the pleasure of talking on with the podcast. So uh, Professor, thank you for coming on the podcast. Yeah, it's great to be here. Awesome. Okay, so the, uh, first I wanna ask you about uh, the Grand Innovation Prize. Can you explain what this is? And I'd like to ask you some more questions about it. Sure. I mean, the basic issue is, is that clearly speed really matters at this point in time in the midst of the pandemic. We've already been too slow. We've been behind the virus every single step of the way. So we want to find a way of, of speeding up the incentives to produce a vaccine or a diagnostic or a therapeutic. And you might say, well, you know, don't the companies, for example, already have an incentive to uh, be quick? And to some extent they do, but not as much as we would like from social incentives. So think, for example, about a uh, vaccine manufacturer. Uh, typically, most vaccines fail, right? They're hard to produce, they're complex, and most of them fail. And what this means is that a vaccine manufacturer, they're not gonna be willing to build a factory, to ramp up a factory, to get the doses flowing, right? until the vaccine has been proven safe and effective and it's gonna be approved, okay? So they're not gonna start moving really until the vaccine is approved. So if you want them to move faster, you've gotta give them bigger incentives. And there's a variety of ways of doing that. One is to have like a big prize, you know, a billion dollars to the first uh, vaccine, which meets a set of criteria. You know, it's effective at, you know, 60%, 70%, has such and such safety criteria and so forth. Or um, you could uh, pay directly um, for uh, manufacturing costs in order to uh, get the a firm to build the factory. You can say, okay, we're going to uh, pay some of your costs. And there's pluses and minuses, but the basic idea of a prize or advanced market commitment or advanced market pur purchase or paying for at-risk capacity is the firms don't have as strong an incentive to ramp up the vaccine quickly as we would like. So we want to give them some extra juice. Gotcha. And the, the incentive is even weaker because you can only sell somebody a vaccine once, if it works at least, right? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So I have a question about um, how, how do you get money to the people? I guess you could give grants for manufacturing, but if somebody has a great idea for creating a vaccine, they, there's a billion dollar price to making that vaccine, uh, but they don't have the initial funding to you know, get that manufacturing or even testing up to par. Um, what do you do about that? Right, so there's a tricky set of trade-offs because on the one hand, uh, the government really is not good at picking winners and losers. Uh, we know that from industrial policy and that holds just as well for vaccine uh, policy. So uh, that pushes you towards just having a, a prize where you just, you know, all, all, all comers. And another advantage of that is we really don't know what kind of vaccine is going to be the most successful. And there's a whole bunch of different types. You know, there's the traditional uh, live attenuated vaccine, a killed virus vaccine. Uh, there are some new vaccines uh, using um, mRNA uh, 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 technology, some DNA uh, vaccines. Uh, and maybe it's not going to be a vaccine at all. Maybe it's a therapeutic, right, which could serve the same kind of uh, purpose. Or maybe there's some other uh, innovation. And when you have a prize, you really are opening up the field to these, to the crazy ones, right? Uh, to the ones who wouldn't necessarily get through the NIH uh, committees, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, of course, the classic uh, longitude uh, story of the longitude prize, which was won not by Newton, but by this uh, watchmaker, clockmaker. Um, however, we also then have the trade off, which is the point that you mentioned is that some firms may not have the uh, capital. And for those firms, there's a greater argument for funding them uh, up front. And here, you know, there's no easy solution uh, in, a, in a pandemic. Um, I kind of think you want to go at all, all guns blazing, okay? You want to use almost all the tools uh, that you have available to you. So what uh, I've been working on this problem with uh, Michael Kramer, Nobel Prize winner, 
who is kind of famous for um, the advanced market commitment for the pneumococcus uh, vaccine, uh, which probably saved 700,000 lives, was given to millions of children. Uh, and in that, the primary tool was the promise of a fixed price if you were to produce such a vaccine. We're more working on the COVID vaccine. We're more pushing towards uh, paying upfront for a large fraction of the mm. uh, manufacturer's costs for producing a factory uh, or for repurposing capacity. Um, and it turns out it's cheaper in, in our context to do that in this way. We could talk more about that. Uh, but there are all, all these trade-offs for sure. Um, and right now we're kind of pushing towards paying more for manufacturing capacity. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Um, why can't it be the case that uh, financial instruments can be created uh, so that you know VCs make their living off of these sort of like high risk, high reward um, investments? Maybe they can like have a deal with a researcher that they'll fund a lot of their fund their testing and manufacturing, and if the vaccine works, then they get half the uh, sure. returns of the price. Sure. I mean, absolutely. When the markets are working well, I mean, that's what would happen. It just takes a long time to set these things up. And at every single stage, there are these information problems. So we say that, you know, the, the government is not good at picking winners and losers. But the truth actually is that the VCs aren't that great at it either, right? Uh, they have a comparative advantage. They have an advantage over the government. I mean, they have skin in the game. But for a VC to learn enough about vaccines and to figure out to, you know, you gotta be on, on, uh, uh, on presence uh, to figure out which, which are the scams, you know, and which are a real possibility of working. This takes time. Um, so I think, look, here, here's how I put it to a few people I've talked with. I've said, you know, I'm a sort of conservative or free market economist, right? So I rarely, if ever, say things like this. But what I've been telling people is, now is the time to throw money at the problem, <laughs> okay? Uh, that's not something I usually say. Um, but the costs of the COVID disaster, uh, which are now running in the trillions, right, are so large that it's really gonna pay, as I said, to kind of advance on all fronts. And we're gonna lose money doing this, okay? There's gonna be waste. Uh, we're gonna fund some vaccines which look great and then fail. Uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, for example, uh, this was early out of the gate. This is from Oxford. Uh, it looked great. They have um, sold, pre-ordered uh, like 2 billion doses. So this is kind of the really the most promising vaccine. A lot of countries have bought into the AstraZeneca vaccine. And as you might know, last week, the uh, trial, one of the clinical trials was shut down uh, because they had uh, a negative effect. They're not sure whether it was due to the vaccine or due to something else, but it's a danger and that, that could happen. I'm not saying the AstraZeneca vaccine is gonna fail. Um, I hope it doesn't. I hope this turns out you know, to be a false alarm, but that could happen at every stage in the process. So you really want to have a diverse set of uh, vaccines in your uh, portfolio. And some of them you know, pay for manufacturing capacity. Some of them pay, uh, have the, the price, the guaranteed price. Uh, we have some, you know, uh, 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 fast grants like Tyler has been given out, uh, you know, take a lot of shots on goal uh, because we don't know which shot on goal is actually going to be the one which uh, succeeds. Hmm. Okay, so let me ask you about uh, prizes generally then. So are you emphasizing prizes in this context uh, because it's such an immediate and big problem that, you know, we should try out different funding mechanisms? Or do you think prizes generally are a use, could be a useful uh, solution in many fields where the problem space or the solution space is big? Yeah, exactly. So the, the, the latter. I mean, I think one advantage of the prize uh, in the current context is it's easy to explain to Congress, okay? Um, so like, like, just do something, okay? And this has been one, incredible frustration to me that Congress has been so lazy, so slow. They're, they're, not, they're so complacent. They're not doing anything. I mean, it took them ages to uh, set up funding for testing, and then they set up the funding and they haven't spent the money. So it, it, it's just incredibly frustrating. Um, and I thought a prize, because you can announce it even before you've you know, gathered the funds or figured out who's gonna be on the prize committee or anything like that, just announce the prize. We're just gonna give, we have this pot of money, it'll be there you know, a year or two from now, we'll figure out who gets it. Um, that, that could be done fairly quickly. And in fact, there is uh, in the code, uh, 
uh, I think from Obama's uh, time, uh, every agency has the right to set up a $50 million prize, up to a $50 million prize, and they can be uh, accumulated. So you, you could have, you know, two or three agencies or four agencies could right now set up a $100 million, $200 million prize uh, just by getting together. They haven't done that, but they could do that. So that was one thing, just the speed. The other th point is the one which you just mentioned is that prizes are particularly good when sort of the experts have kind of failed. Uh, usually the experts are right. Don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-expert. <laughs> usually the experts are, are the best people to go to. But then sometimes you have a problem where the experts have run against the wall and you need to uh, take a very broad view and you need to get the crazies in and you need to get the, the out of the box thinkers and uh, a prize could be very useful for that. Hmm. So why, why don't we have uh, prizes in other fields? Like why are grants the dominant way of funding research? It's a good question. Um, and I don't really know the answer. Prizes were much more common in the 19th century. And then they kind of failed, failed off or trailed off in the 20th century. And they've seen a little bit of a resurgence uh, in more recent uh, decades. One reason perhaps is that the, you know, giving out money is kind of a powerful uh, job. And if you're doing it, you know, the NIH or a committee, you know, the people you, you, you bring in, you give out the money to the people who are giving out the money. Um, and that's a very nice kind of job, very nice, can be a very nice job to have. Uh, and a prize, if it's set up correctly, where, you know, you have a fairly strict guidelines as to what meets it and what doesn't meet it, um, and you only get it if you win, that kind of gives less power to the prize givers. And maybe that's part of it, but I'm not, I'm not really sure actually. It's a puzzle. It's a puzzle as to why uh, grants have been used much more than prizes. Hmm. Um, and, but why don't we see evidence of the uh, clear efficacy of prizes? Um, because there doesn't seem to be a clear coordination problem here. Like just an altruistic patron could just decide to like set up prizes for not necessarily this problem, but just a lot of other problems. And if for many problems, prizes are more effective, we should see that the results from these prizes, the innovations they create are just much more effective than uh, the grants that are afforded in that field. So why aren't we seeing like the clear evidence of the superiority of the prize? Well, we do have some evidence on this. Uh, for example, there are these uh, Howard Hughes grants. Uh, so Howard Hughes actually tried to set up a tax dodge <laughs> and uh, ended up found, founding the, you know, Howard Hughes Medical Centers, um, which have lasted much longer than his, uh, his tax dodge. So he had some benefits uh, there. Um, and the distinguishing feature of these Howard Hughes, Howard Hughes grants is that they say, okay, here's a bunch of money. Come back to us in five years and tell us what you did with it. Okay. Um, you don't really have to come up with a plan or tell them what you're going to do. They're sort of like a genius grant in some ways. And it turns out that those uh, grants are much more effective. Uh, the researchers who uh, get them, uh, that research tends to be much higher cited, more patents and so forth. And now you, of course, you have to control for the fact that the researchers who get these grants are different than the researchers who get other types of grants. But even when you do that, even when you set up some fine, uh, some fine controls, uh, it looks like giving money with less strings attached um, actually is uh, more successful. Uh, we'll also see with my colleague, as you know, Tyler Cowan uh, has given out uh, more than $20 million uh, in COVID grants and given them out incredibly quickly. I think Tyler gave out $20 million faster than the NIH had given out a single grant. Um, so we'll see how effective uh, that have been. There've already been some good returns from that. Um, so maybe, we'll, maybe there'll be a resurgence uh, in uh, prize giving or fast Absolutely. grants or prize giving or however you wanna call it. Oh, interesting. Um, okay, so now let me ask you about uh, the Bamul effect. Yeah, Bamul, yeah. So, um, so we have these industries uh, where every year, just the prices just seem to keep going up and up and up and up without, without fail. Um, and uh, education, uh, both primary and you know, secondary education, as well as uh, university education, you know, is one example where the prices sort of in inexorably, it seems, uh, go up. Uh, healthcare um, is, is another one. Um, but there's other ones as well. Those are the ones which are big and the most common but another thing people have noticed, for example, is that 
uh, fixing things, uh, repairs, uh, seem to go up a lot, a lot over time. So it's much more expensive to have a pair of shoes uh, uh, repaired uh, today than it used to be. Auto repair has been going up in, in price uh, over time relative to other uh, goods and services. So much that, you know, for example, um, I had to replace the blade on my lawnmower. Well, I didn't have to replace it. The blade on my lawnmower got dull. Now, even 30 years ago, you'd probably go to a sharpener. But I didn't do that. I just went to Amazon and ordered a new blade, right? No one sharpens their blades anymore, you know, maybe for like a $200 knife, but not for a, uh, uh, a lawnmower, right? So you just buy another one, which is what I did. So anyway, so the question is, why are these, why is it that some sets of goods and services appears to be going up over time? And uh, William Baumel is an economist. Uh, he has an explanation uh, for that. Traditional explanations, of course, as you're probably familiar with, say, well, there's something wrong with the education industry. There's too much government, right? Um, or there's something wrong with healthcare. Um, and in each case, there's like some special story. And the story that Baumel gives, which is why one of the reasons I like it, it's like one theory to rule them all, okay? Um, but that's kind of the background. So we have this set of industries, prices appear to be going up year after year after year, and the question is why. What we did, Eric Allen and I, in this little book, is first of all, we looked at, at the kind of traditional story. Is it like unions? You know, is it regulation? Uh, and it, it just doesn't appear to fit. It doesn't appear to fit. Uh, so what is the Bommel, what is the Bommel story? I, I explain it different ways when people ask me. I think I'll explain it in a different way today. I think the way to think about it is to think, first of all, in terms of real goods and services. Just think about the, the bar, a barter economy or uh, uh, forget prices for a second and just think about kind of real goods and services, the real economy. And you have some sets of goods and services which are increasing in productivity every year, right? So computers, they're getting faster. Uh, and they're getting more you know, powerful uh, every year. Uh, manufacturing, right? We're able to manufacture a, a car uh, using you know, less steel than ever before and in a shorter amount of time using less labor uh, you know, and, and, and so forth. So these goods are increasing in productivity. There's some other industries which for whatever reason um, are just slower increasing in productivity. I mean, you're bound to have some randomness or just some differences, right? Some, some industries for technological reasons are increasing in productivity faster than other industries. So if you think about these two different types of industries, one of which is the progressive sector, the other of which is the, the slower sector, the slower productivity sector. It doesn't have to be negative productivity, just it's growing more slowly in terms of productivity. So you get, uh, in the progressive sector, you get a lot more output per input over time. And in the stagnant sector, only very slowly does output grow per unit of input. Well, if you think about that, then it has to be the case that prices in the stagnant or less productive sector have to be going up. And the simple reason is because goods trade for one another. So if you can get a lot more goods in the progressive sector, well, that means if you want more of the uh, stagnant sector, you have to give up a lot, okay? Because you can get a lot, right? Um, so the, kind of the classic example is the uh, symphony, right? Or the uh, string quartet, right? And you think about 1826, the string quartet, it takes four people 40 minutes to do a Haydn string quartet. And you think about, you know, 2020, it takes four people, you know, 40 minutes to do a string quartet. So their productivity hasn't gone up at all. But what you can get, the opportunity cost of that has gone way up. So in, you know, 1820 to hire four people, you know, for 40 minutes, you are giving up, you know, I don't know, so like a, a bicycle, whatever you want to call it, something, you know. Uh, but now if you give up, you know, four people for 40 minutes, that's worth a lot. You know, you can get, you know, the movies and a dinner out and, you know, uh, two bicycles or whatever, right? So you're just giving up a lot more. Um, and that's really why the price has gone up is because of the progressive sector. So to put it the other way, it's not that there's a problem 
with the stagnant sector. I mean, it's not a direct problem in any case. It's not that there's something wrong, unions or you know regulation or something like that. What's really going on is something good. Uh, it's something good about the progressive sector. That's why things are getting more expensive because you can you have to give up a lot more uh, because this sector is becoming much more uh, productive. Uh, let me just give you one other way of thinking about that. And that is what this implies is that prices in the uh, stagnant sector will start to go up less quickly when the progressive sector is slowing down. So this means that the prices in the stagnant sector go up much more quickly when you have a lot of growth in the productive sector. And now with the great stagnation, okay, as growth is slowing down, we're actually seeing like healthcare prices are going up less quickly. So when did healthcare prices really go up? The big increase in healthcare prices was in the 60s, 50s and 60s. And that's when healthcare prices really exploded. Uh, they grew much more quickly, like 10% a year. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's when productivity was going up. So now productivity is slowing down and we're seeing prices are not going up so quickly in these stagnant sectors. So that kind of tells you this is not a good thing, right? So higher prices could be a bad, could be a good thing in some ways. And, you know, less price inflation uh, could be a bad thing. Yeah, it's such an interesting explanation. It just changes all of the uh, prevailing wisdom that you hear everywhere about uh, why, why these um, why these industries are getting so much more expensive. But I have a few questions about that. So, sure. uh, so as you laid out, one of the explanations of the bubble effect is that uh, one of the main uh, inputs into many of these sectors is labor. And right. if you can get more out of labor in one sector over time and not so much in the other sector, uh, they're willing to pay more for labor in the progressive sector, and that raises the price of labor everywhere. Um, but how can labor be getting more expensive at a time where we keep hearing about wage stagnation? Uh, about what stagnation? Oh, wage stagnation. Wage, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so first of all, we hear about wage stagnation. So this is something which Helen and I actually add to the Bommel effect um, in, in our book, because Bommel was exactly, as you said, most focused on kind of labor in general. And we just give it a slight twist in our, our book. We say, look, uh, it's skilled labor. Uh, it's skilled labor, which in particular has uh, gone up in price because uh, it's become a skilled laborer is much more va valuable in Silicon Valley, right, than they used to be. And so you think about healthcare, you think about education, these are sectors which involved a lot of skilled labor, okay? Um, so I have a PhD. Uh, I teach, you know, typically like 30 students. We'll talk about online education later. But let's see, I teach 30 students a semester. That's a really expensive use of someone with a PhD, right? I'm teaching 30 students and, you, you, I, you know, I don't want to say like I could go to Silicon Valley and, you know, be rich or whatever, but someone like me could, right? Uh, that's, that is the trade-off which we're talking about as a society, not Alex Tabra could, you know, suddenly move to Silicon Valley. Um, but somebody who has the opportunity of getting an econ economics PhD, they can spend their lives teaching 30 students at a time, or they could go work for Uber, which a lot of economics PhDs do, uh, or for Amazon, right? And so the opportunity cost of a PhD has gone way up because now they can be hired, you know, for Amazon or Uber. And that's why, but they're still doing exactly the same thing in the classroom. They're still just teaching 30 students. So that, that price has got to be going, uh, has got to be going up. Does the Bamboo effect suggest that AI automation fears are overhyped? Because more and more of the economy is uh, service-based uh, because, I mean, that, that sector isn't growing more productive, so it's not growing smaller. Um, and also that the value of labor goes up over time as the sectors that are becoming more productive can produce more. Yeah, yes and no. Um, so it's definitely true that the service sector has grown uh, over time. And in general, you know, the stagnant sectors will grow over time because there's only so many cars you can have or want really probably, right? Um, so even if when cars get uh, uh, less expensive, people might have one or two, uh, uh, and the quality goes up somewhat, but there's kind of a limit to, you know, revenues in that sector. Um, 
So the stagnant sectors do tend to grow. So education and healthcare have become a bigger part of our economy, which is kind of natural. Now, does this mean that AI is overblown? I think it, it means that we're not gonna run out of work. That's true. But I do worry, and as we're already seeing, that certain types of labor um, you know, can be overrun by uh, automation, right? So, you know, less skilled labor, uh, their wages have not been going up. Um, and partly that's uh, automation, uh, partly that's trade. Um, and that is only going to become uh, more serious with remote work and uh, as well with automation. So, yeah, I, I do worry about if you can't have, if you can't raise your education level, you can't raise the skill level of your workers, um, then you're in real trouble. Um, you know, people are very flexible. Um, that is true. Uh, but, you know, I think about horses, right? Uh, you know, the horse, when we introduce the automobile, it's not like horses all found alternative employment. Uh, they found the glue factory, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, horses are pretty flexible. I mean, you can do a lot of things with horses. Um, but it's not like they all slotted into different areas of the economy like the, you know, I mean, we did have more, uh, you know, horses for recreation and so forth. Uh, but no, all, overall, the number of horses is down. And so I worry about less skilled uh, labor. Hmm. Um, and how much of the great that you mentioned the great stagnation, how much of it can be explained by just the economy over time is more and more dominated by the sectors that are growing in productivity the least? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, as you shift to the service sector, you see a uh, decline in your growth rate simply because you're buying more of the things which are growing more slowly. Um, and that's going to continue. Um, uh, it, 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 it can be part of a naturally growing um, a economy. Um, there's a new good book on this. Uh, you, you probably know it. I've forgotten. Uh, I should think of the title. Uh, oh, the author is going to be mad at me for not. I'll come back to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's an optimal stagnation. Okay. So it can be good that uh, we are growing more slowly in the sense that you have focused your spending on sectors which are growing more slowly and that's kind of a natural change. Now, obviously what we would like is for all sectors to boom um, and maybe we could do something about that, um, but it's not gonna be easy. Uh, uh, so speaking of one of these uh, slow growth sectors, let's talk about education. So you, right. write, in, you write in the paper, um, to decrease the college wage premium and the relative price of goods and services that use college educated workers, we need to increase the educational attainment of the U.S. workforce. Now, my first guest on the podcast was uh, your colleague, Brian Kaplan, and right. he would argue probably the opposite, that he'd say, you're just increasing the cost of signaling if you make people have uh, higher educational attainment because they had a signal relative to the other counterparts who are now more highly educated. Um, uh, so how would you respond to that? Yeah, so... Um... There's clearly, Brian is clearly right uh, that there's a lot of signaling uh, involved, particularly in college education. Um, that's not the only type of education that counts, for example. Um, in Germany and Austria and many of the European countries, they invest a lot more in uh, apprenticeships and worker training, okay? Um, so the interesting thing is, is that we have this crazy system um, in the United States where uh, the high school graduation rate is actually quite low compared to other countries. Uh, I think at the time I wrote my book, it was only like 75% for men. It's gone up since then. It's maybe like 80, 85%. But we still have a large chunk of our workforce, which does not graduate high school. But then of those who graduate high school, we send a huge proportion to college way more than in Europe, in Germany, okay? So we're sending like 60, 70% of those who graduate high school then go on to college. And in Germany, it's more like, you know, 40%. I can't remember the exact figures, but it's something like that, okay? So it's like a completely crazy system. And, and, on, on, and on the other hand, in Germany, they're, almost everybody graduates high school, like 97%, something like that, right? So I think we can rebalance here 
Um, definitely more people should graduate high school. Um, more people should be highly skilled. Does that mean they should be going to college? No, because when a lot of these kids go to college and then they take, um, you know, I'm going to upset some of my uh, friends, then they go into journalism, right? Which is like <laughs> a terrible field or psychology, right? These are terrible fields to go into for, for jobs. Um, and yet these fields, journalism and psychology in particular, have grown. The number of people shockingly going into computer science has been like flat for like 30 years. I mean, you would think whatever field has grown more than computer science, you would think it would be booming. But actually, no, it's pretty flat. Um, and what increases we have seen in people going into computer science has all been foreign students, okay? So the foreign students, they don't, you know, if you're from South Korea or uh, India, you don't come to the United States to do a journalism degree or psychology, <laughs> right? You know, your parents aren't going to allow you to do that. Uh, you come to get some hard science, right? And uh, so I think the U.S. students should do more of that. Yeah, I, I promise I'm not contributing to the problem. I'm, I'm right here at university studying computer science. Um, okay, so but... I, I, I didn't want to make any presumptions. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you fit the uh, correct, uh, uh, the correct uh, you know, modus operandi. You do, you're doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah. I, it would have been quite a, it would be pretty funny if I was right here studying journalism and ha had to hear, hear you say that. Um, <laughs> um, okay, but so but now you, let's talk you actually could be a good journalist. <laughs> there might be room for you. <laughs> uh, um, and that, that, so let's talk about something um, that you have launched, uh, Marginal Revolution Online University, which is trying to uh, change up the system a little bit. Um, and so you, you've written about online education and how it's going to, how these massive open online courses are going to select for the best teachers. Um, uh, what's going to happen to the rest of the people who are trying to teach right now or are already teaching? Yeah. So I think the long run is pretty bad um, for teachers. Uh, you know, we always complained that, uh, you know, look how poorly we teach our teachers. You know, we pay them less than our sports stars, right? You know, you know basketball or something like that. And what's going to happen is we're going to pay our teachers more like basketball stars and, and baseball stars, but there's just going to be a lot fewer of them, right? Because when you teach online, uh, you know, I said earlier, I teach 30 students, but with Marshall Revolution University, I can teach 300 students and I do. Um, so I, hundreds of hundreds of thousands of students. So like why, uh, you, you know, then there's, uh, fr I mean, frankly, uh, People like me, if not me, um, are going to drive a lot of people in the teaching business out of business. And that actually would be a good thing. Um, because, you know, why should you... The, the problem is education has always been difficult to scale, right? Uh, it's such a one-on-one -on -one kind of business. And if you're able to scale education, as, as actually we're being forced to uh, because of the pandemic. But if you're able to scale education, there are huge, huge, massive returns that are possible there. Um, so whoever cracks that nut, I don't think it's been cracked entirely. Um, uh, you know, I think we've gone a long way, Marshall Revolution University, but we're only the beginning. Uh, whoever cracks that nut is going to do it incredibly well because you go from one person teaching 30 students at a time to literally you could teach the entire world and you tie, this goes back to the Bommel effect, if you can tie uh, education to a progressive sector, right, instead of tying it to a labor intensive sector, you tie it to technology, which is a progressive sector, then, you know, all bets are off, everything can change really, really quickly. So artificial tutors, artificial tutors are already as good in randomized controlled trials as real tutors. Okay. Uh, and uh, you, you, you homework assessment systems. I mean, so what a, uh, an AI uh, can do is look at hundreds of thousands of student responses on a test, for example. And then it can figure out, looking at, you've written some tests, and it'll see your pattern of errors. And it says, aha, okay, machine learning. I can see, the machine will be able to see what concept you're not grasping. And so instead of just repeating, you know, the lesson, okay, the artificial tutor can pinpoint and direct the student exactly 
to that piece of knowledge, oh, you're using the quadratic formula incorrectly. This is what you need to know, okay? It can direct them exactly to that piece of knowledge which they need to unlock um, the, key, the key to learning. So the students can advance much more quickly. So I think there's huge, huge possibilities for um, artificial intelligence and for uh, you know, video online learning and so forth. Uh, so you give out these optimistic scenarios of how education is going to change, but a pessimist might say, well, listen, we've, we've gotten these sort of uh, predictions back since Edison said that the motion picture is going to change education forever. And the same thing happened with the radio, with books, with uh, right. television. So what's different this time? How is it this is going to disrupt the system that's been around for a thousand years? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You would think that with books, right? You know, oh, you can get all this knowledge, you know, in this book, and then you can carry it around with you. You know, you can read it at night whenever you want to. You know, this is much better than having to talk with some professor guy. Um, yeah, the book has a lot of the advantages which I claim for online education. So this makes me, uh, um, I don't know, worried or humble or modest or, or yeah, I could be wrong. It's it's for sure. Um, you know, I, I do, th I, I tend to think though that, so, you know, it's, 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 it's bad to say this time is different, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but it is interesting how a group of technologies, uh, come together, which, uh, seemingly, uh, small differences can make big effects. So I think, for example, about the Apple Newton. Okay. So the Newton was basically a, uh, a cell phone. It was basically a portable computer, kind of a, uh, but it was just, it, it, for, it, just, it wasn't quite fast enough. It, it wasn't connected to the internet enough. Um, so it just, it, the Newton never took off. And yet really just, a, it's really just a small step from the Newton to the iPhone. And yet the iPhone was huge, okay? But technologically, there's very little difference between the Newton and the iPhone. The Newton was a failure. The iPhone was a huge success. So I think just in kind of the speed um, at which things can be done online um, and just the, the, the quality of uh, the animations, the music, the artificial intelligence, all of these things advancing, you kind of reach a threshold and, and then you get, and then things boom. And I can tell you that my students, um, you know, I teach a bunch of students online at George Mason University, a lot of them, surprising even to me, tell me that they prefer uh, online. Uh, they prefer at least my class uh, uh, online. And you know, this makes sense because students have different methods of learning and the kind of the classroom kind of sucks, right? I mean, you sometimes you can't hear the professor, uh, you know, you have to be there at a certain time at a certain place, you can't pause, you feel you can't ask questions. With online, something you know you didn't quite hear, you didn't understand, you just pause it, you know, and you rewind, right? Or uh, think about podcasts. Um, you know, I think a lot of us are very familiar with listening to podcasts at, you know, 1.5 or 1.25 speed, right? Because uh, then you just slow down when there's something new and you speed up when there's something not new. And that's like a huge advantage, okay? So I can learn a lot more with the podcast uh, just because I'm in control of the speed, you know? And um, so this means that online students can go at their own pace. Uh, so there's a huge number of advantages. And this idea of tying it to a progressive sector, I think it's important as well. This is an example I gave, which, which we discovered purely by accident, is that we captioned all of our um, videos um, in English, okay? And then we discovered, you know, that YouTube automatically takes the English captions and translates them into dozens, hundreds of other languages. And what this means is that every improvement in deep mind, right? Every improvement in artificial intelligence automatically turns into an improvement in our product because periodically, you know, the captions, they get better without us having to do any work, right? Uh, just the YouTube algorithms, you know, improves the captions over time. And so our product is becoming better even without us making any changes. Hmm. But uh, I don't want to speak for Brian Kaplan here, but maybe somebody might say, uh, what if you're just solving the wrong, wrong problem, that people aren't really giving up four years of their life to get a better education? 
uh, I might just be speaking for myself here, but uh, your videos are much better as far as an economics course goes than my high school economics course. And, you know, I still have to attend my high school economics course and my uh, college economics course. Um, and so unless we can figure out a way for people to signal their uh, intelligence and conscientiousness through online courses, people are not going to substitute this for what college provides. Right. So, so this is why I think that um, the online, uh, the MOOCs, as it were, you know, Coursera and things like that, they're not going to replace universities. But universities are going to go online, right? So you still need that stamp. Um, you still need, we, we haven't cracked that nut. Uh, maybe we will uh, either, you, you know, um, there are some ways of doing it in, in some fields right now, like computer science. Uh, but you're right, we haven't cracked that nut. But that's why universities will be the ones who go online. They're not going to be, and not all of them are going to make the transition. You know, we're seeing this right now with the pandemic. A lot of universities are falling by the wayside. But uh, the ones which can um, uh, have a reputation, um, uh, a high reputation, they're going to be able to go online and they're going to be able to expand their market. Now, some of them you don't want to, like Harvard does not want to expand its market. But a place like George Mason, where I teach, okay, has a decent reputation in the world, okay, and we'd be very happy to expand our market. Uh, we'd be happy to have tens of thousands of students uh, all over the world. Uh, Georgia Tech has done this probably, as you know, uh, better than anybody. Uh, Georgia Tech has the largest computer science program uh, in master, master's program um, in the world, it has something like 7,000 online students. The online students are treated exactly as the uh, residential, residential students. They're graded in exactly the same way. The professors don't even know which is online, which is not uh, online. Um, it is a hugely successful, it graduates, I think like 7% of all the computer science masters uh, in, in the world. So it's a hugely successful program. And they're only able, it's a quarter of the price, less than a quarter of the price online than it is residential. So that I think is a, uh, a trailblazer or a warning sign, depending on your point of view. But Georgia Tech has taken a, on, a master's degree in computer science and successfully brought it online to the entire world. And that is a mark for the future. Hmm. Uh, now tell me if this is too optimistic a scenario, but is it or if it's precluded by Bamul's effect as well. But is it possible that the people who would have been teachers otherwise, but now are being outcompeted by the best teachers in the world, they right. will just end up being uh, personal tutors and then we can get back to like a sort of older model of one-on-one -on -one instruction. Or is this gonna be think, too expensive? Yeah, some of that will, will happen. So I think, uh, you know, what, what is the real nut to crack? Um, a lot of it, right, is uh, I'm going to sound contradictory because uh, I'm going to say psychology, right? <laughs> Not that you need a degree in psychology, but um, people are going to need coaches, right? So, you know, life coaches, which people laugh at because you know, only the rich and famous, you know, have a, you know, a life coach or whatever, right? Um, but that is a large part of uh, education, I think, is going to be more like sports people, people in sports, they all have coaches. So why shouldn't you and I have coaches? Um, so I think there will be a, uh, industry for life coaches, somebody to encourage you, somebody to uh, try and map out your skills, uh, kind of like what the high school advisors are supposed to do. You know, you're this sort of person, you should go to hit this, you know, there'd be a lot more of that. Um, so education will be debundled, right? Um, the kind of traditional lecture part of it sage on the stage or all that, that transmission of information. Um, that part will go online and a, many, a much smaller number of teachers will teach many more people. But the coaching part of it, uh, the, the possibly the tutoring uh, will be spread out. Um, because it'll be much more hierarchical um, actually. So, you know, one guy at the top will have this kind of hierarchy of TAs and things like that. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of how college children. works anyway, sit a little bit. <laughs> a li little bit already, yeah, yeah. but uh, even more so, right? Like right. we, you're absolutely, we have it already where, you know, Michael Sandel, you know, teaches, you know, 400 students or whatever in his philosophy class and has a bunch of TAs, um, but you multiply that by a factor of 10 or a factor by 100. And so I think the model will, which have already started, Tyler and I have already kind of started this, but, oops, 
Um, the model will be kind of uh, you, you, you teach online, right? And then you show up at different places around the world for like guest appearances. Okay. <laughs> so I've been to India a couple of times. I go and I teach there and the old students all know me, right? It's just kind of weird, right? But the, they're all, they are all oh, Professor Tavarak, you know, they all, they are, they're already familiar with me. They know how I teach and so forth. And then I just show up in the class so I can kind of see a model um, like Paul Erdos, you know, the famous mathematician who would just go around the world and, co-author with different uh, mathematicians, uh, never had a fixed address. I can see some teachers doing that, just kind of going around the world. And uh, they teach a few days in, in South Korea and a few days in India and, and uh, kind of it builds up this community. Uh, most of the teaching is online, but then, you know, you get to meet the person occasionally. Uh, uh, but with the Bamul effect, uh, shouldn't I expect that um, because if education now becomes a progressive sector because of the substitute, then it's going to exasperate, uh, you know, the increasing cost and in, uh, things like TAs or coaches or whatever else that, you know. Yeah, requires. so we're, so yeah, we're, we're never going to, um, the, 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 so there are two effects going on at the same time, which uh, Bommel nicely uh, has both of them. And that is, you know, why is the, stagnant sector becoming a higher price. Well, it's becoming a higher price because the progressive sector is, is growing more productive. But that means you're also getting richer. So there's a substitution effect and there's an income effect, okay? Um, so and that's an interesting thing about uh, education and healthcare um, is that even as the price has gone up, we're spending more on these goods, right? And that's really bizarre from just about the perspective of just about any other theory. Because if you think that the problem is a lack of pro uh, negative productivity or regulation or something like that, right? Well, then if education is becoming more expensive because of costs are going up, well, then you want to consume less, right? Uh, so then why would you be consuming more when the price is going up? You need like two theories to explain this. One theory to explain why the price is going up. And then you need like another theory. Well, we're becoming more credentialed or whatever to explain why people are consuming more of this good. In Bommel, the, you're pushing out the production possibility frontier as it is becoming um, a more curved at the same time. So the price is going up, but you're also becoming richer. So Bommel explains both of these things very, very nicely. It's not contradictory at all in Bommel's theory that you would spend more on a good even as the price is going up. Because the reason the price is going up is in part because we're becoming more generally richer over time. Right, and so it's becoming more affordable. Uh, but then you also point out in the paper that even though we have more teachers per capita now, math scores really haven't increased. Right. Um, so shouldn't we expect like if teachers are going up, it, it's not just the cost per teacher, it's also the amount of teachers we have. Shouldn't that at least increase the outcomes we get? Yeah. So. You're absolutely right. Um, and if you were dealing with kind of a fixed uh, set of students, um, I think that would happen. Um, but we are, as I mentioned, you know, many, many more people are going to um, college than ever did before. And that just means like that the standards are going down and the students, the, I mean, frankly, the students just need a lot more handholding today um, than they did um, in the past, because in the past, I, I mean, you just had the elite, which was going to college, right? And uh, these people could kind of take care of themselves. They came from uh, wealthy uh, families um, and could kind of take care of themselves. And now we're just having many, a much wider variety of students are um, coming to college and they do need a lot more input. Um, wow. now, now, there is another factor uh, which is tied with the great stagnation it, which is very worrying is that we seem to be needing a lot more input um, per unit of output in even in the progressive sectors. Like I mentioned, computers uh, are becoming much more faster and so forth. But if you look at the number of researchers in the computer yeah, sector, yeah. like, yeah, yeah, kind of, you know, guys figuring out, I'm, I'm not talking about computer scientists, I'm fi the guys who are working on the chips, right? Uh, the electrical engineers, I suppose. Okay, you need many more electrical engineers to get the same growth rate uh, today than you did in the past. Um, and the same thing, you know, I work a lot on pharmaceuticals. Um, 
I tend to, you know, focus on the FDA and the FDA kind of slows things down. But even putting aside that, the amount of research and development budget, which goes into creating a new pharmaceutical is much higher today than in the past. And it's not just a regulation effect. Uh, you also have just many more scientists, uh, it seems, to get the same, you know, life expectancy uh, increase from a pharmaceutical than you did, you know, in the past. It was more low-hanging fruit in the past. Right. Yeah, as you know, and as Tyler Cowen wrote about, uh, Nicholas Bloom and uh, others wrote right. a paper where they, they, they talked about this. Like, there's, we need 18 times as many semiconductor engineers just to uh, get the same Moore's law. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, the same Moore's law doubling of uh, transistors every two years. Yeah, uh, exactly. It's, it's very worrying. Um, so kind of one hopes that maybe we will see kind of some quantum leap in some technology. Um, you know, you kind of get a, a quantum leap, right? And then you get diminishing returns and then you get another quantum leap. So I'm hopeful that, you know, maybe it's quantum computers. I don't know, quantum leap, but, uh, <laughs> you know, hopefully we'll see some, some, you know, uh, grow, some sector will explode. Uh, otherwise those facts, which you just mentioned are kind of really disturbing. Yeah, they, they mentioned that it was uh, every 13 years, you need to double the amount of researchers to get the same growth. So we yeah. could just have every pair of 13 year olds just have four research kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's, it's disturbing because, right, because um, you would have predicted that with many more researchers, research is a public good, uh, you know, ideas are free, they flow everywhere, that you would have had much, much more uh, advance. And it just seems that we've only barely been able to keep pace, um, if that. You know, I am optimistic sort of, you know, that with China and India becoming richer, that you get a lot more scientists and engineers in the world as a whole. Um, and that'll give us a boost. Um, but so far, it, you know, it's not, it, it's not the huge gain that one would have hoped for. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just plugged those numbers into like, uh, uh, into some code. And it turns out that if, if the, if, you know, research productivity declines every 13 years or has every 13 years, you plateau at like 40% increase or something like that. Um, but if it doesn't, in the next entry, you could get like 600% growth uh, otherwise. Right, um, right. So there's, a, so there's a small possibility of a very big gain if we get lucky, um, you know. but the trend is not good. Yeah. Um, oh, so, so let me ask now about um, dominant assurance contracts. Uh, before I ask you some more questions about it and we get in the weeds, do you want to explain what that is? Sure. Um, so, uh, so dominant, it's kind of interesting. Um, this is maybe is my most important paper, but it's kind of overlooked. Um, except recently it's grown a little bit, but this solves the public good problem. Uh, that's a little <laughs> bit of an exaggeration, <laughs> right? But, uh, you know, Paul Samuelson said this problem was impossible to solve. And for a long time, it looked like, you know, you couldn't solve this public good problem. And the public good problem, right, is that, um, for a good which benefits everybody, you know, non-rival, uh, non-excludable, okay? Uh, there's gonna be a free rider problem, okay? And so people won't wanna contribute uh, to it, even though it benefits everybody. People say, oh, I'm gonna sit back, I'm gonna let the other guy contribute to it, and then I'll benefit without having to pay the cost. And of course, if very, when everyone does this, you don't get the public good at all, right? So how to produce public goods? It's a huge, huge problem. And um, it looked like this was impossible to solve. Now, I solved part of it with this dominant assurance contract, uh, which is easier to explain today than when I wrote the paper because uh, when I, before I wrote the, I wrote the paper before Kickstarter, okay? So um, Kickstarter is now something almost quite similar, some, not quite the same, but similar. So in Kickstarter, um, you contribute towards the public good and you only pay if enough other people contribute that you reach the threshold, right? You get over the, you get over the line and then, uh, then you have to pay. So Kickstarter solves one problem in that you're not worried that the other people, you know, just won't show up and then your, your funds will be wasted, okay? Your funds are never wasted. Uh, your funds only are taken from you if enough people show up to contribute towards the public good. Okay, that's an assurance contract. Here's the dominant insurance contract. Uh, it has just one simple twist. It says, if, uh, not, if you don't reach the threshold, then everybody who agreed to pay gets a refund bonus, 
Okay. So uh, therefore, think about it. You're thinking about whether should I contribute to this project or not? Well, there's really only two cases you need to consider. One is if the project is uh, successful, then I get the benefit of the public good. There's some uh, a benefit there. So that's a positive good to me. If the project is not successful, if not enough other people contribute, okay, then I want to contribute because I'll get the refund bonus and I won't have to do anything, okay? So either way, you're actually better off contributing than not contributing. So what this means is that it turns an insurance contract into a dominant insurance contract, which means that it's now a dominant strategy, okay, in some circumstances, if uh, you, to contribute to the public good because you benefit either, either way, right? And so um, this means, it just doesn't solve all public good problems um, because we, it, it, it solves it for kind of a public good where you know the right size. So if you wanna build a bridge, it's usually not too hard to figure out should be a two lane bridge or a four lane bridge, okay? Or a lighthouse, okay? You just have to figure out how much is it gonna cost for the right size lighthouse. It solves the contribution problem. There are other public goods where you're not quite sure how much of it should you actually produce, like defense. Like, should it be 100 billion, 200 billion, 500 billion? How much do people actually want? This does not solve that, but it does solve the contribution problem. And what some colleagues and I, um, uh, Tim uh, Kaysen and Robert Zuberkus, uh, what we've actually shown is this works in the lab. Uh, so we've run experiments and the dominant insurance contract is able to uh, double the number of projects which are successful. So if you could put this on Kickstarter, uh, you could probably double the number of successful projects. Uh, so it does actually work. Uh, compared to a, just a normal insurance market. Correct, correct. Okay. So most projects on Kickstarter fail. Um, we think some of them should fail. Some of them are just bad projects. But we think some of them fail because um, the insurance contract doesn't solve all of these problems. But the, a dominant insurance contract a, it would allow more good projects to succeed. That is, you have some project where the uh, benefits are bigger than the costs, um, a dominant insurance contract will help you to get those good projects, it will help those projects be successful. Yeah, it's such a, such a brilliant idea and useful idea because like it takes the equilibrium from being towards being a free rider to, to, like, to actively contributing to the public good. Uh, uh, so what about projects though that are, uh, you, you mentioned like a bridge, for example, right? But there's like a notorious problem of the inflation of the budget over time. So, you know, it, it was projected to be 10 million, but now we can't build it unless we get an extra 10 million. Uh, what do you do if that kind of thing happens? Well, one problem at a time, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, th th that, that's going to happen whether it's a public good or not. Right. Um, so, you know, you're, you're absolutely right that there is a tendency for these big dig projects to um, inflate uh, in scale. And, and there's a, you know, there's a problem, especially in the United States with why, uh, you know, subways and construction and uh, tunnels, why they're so expensive here compared to the rest of the world. Right. Um, and part of it, part of that problem is unions. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, but there's a variety of reasons uh, for that: unions and legalism, and you know we've, uh, you know, historical committees, and we've, you know, we've just put on so many um, uh, requirements uh, to build that it's just become really, really difficult and expensive. Um, so, dominant insurance contract does not solve all problems. Uh. So is a path for libertarian minded people like you and me to, instead of having to like convince a majority of people to uh, adopt our ideas, to just like set up alternative institutions that are based on ideas like this? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think that's a very progressive way of thinking about it, right? Is that I've actually said that it could very well be the case that we need many more public goods, especially local public goods. And a dominant insurance contract is a way of bringing this out of uh, showing that this is true. Um, so if we can allow, if we can create a regime under which not just dominant insurance contracts, but uh, you know, uh, Glenn Weil and Vitalik uh, Buterin and uh, a co-author, um, uh, Zoe, I believe, uh, you know, they have, a, they, have an, they have other schemes as well, right? So there are these mechanisms um, 
some of which use the blockchain, some of which work online, some of which don't work online, um, to produce public goods. And I, I, I would, creating a market mechanism, it sounds contradictory, but designing a market to produce public goods um, could change, you know, everything, right? Uh, and I think that would be a very a kind of a progressive way of thinking about things. Instead of saying, you know, the government's doing it wrong all the time, um, let's create an alternative institution which can do things better. Yeah, yeah. It, the optimistic scenario here is, um, so Eliezer Rudowski wrote a book called Inadequate Equilibria, as I'm right. sure you know, and then he, he detailed three ways in which like a civilization can feel. Asymmetric information, which, and you wrote an article with Tyler Cowen on how that's becoming a smaller problem. Um, decision maker is not the beneficiary, which is not a problem because of uh, dominant assurance contracts. And also um, inoptimal Nash equilibria, which is also not a problem because of dominant assurance contracts. Is this, so is this just like the future? Is this, is this how we solve a bunch of the problems, coordination problem, whatever else this is, there are? Uh, well, well, I guess we'll see. Um, try to get the paper. Uh, you, you never know until the paper gets out into the world, right? Um, so uh, hopefully. Uh, I do think that, you know, democracy itself is a, is a mechanism. It is a, it's, a, it, it's a mechanism to both um, collect and aggregate preferences and to um, kind of uh, exclude dictatorial. Uh, it's to improve governments. Right? It's, a, it's a governance mechanism, right? And uh, we've now had, you know, 200, 250 years of experience. Uh, and we know it works well in some cases and less well in, in other cases. It's not a great preference aggregation mechanism. It is actually a pretty good way of limiting government. Um, there are things which democratic governments don't do. Democratic governments do not starve their own citizens. That's a very low bar, but it's a low bar which many governments fail to meet, right? Um, so democracy has a lot of benefits, um, but it's not the end of the story either. Um, there are different types of democracies. There's different ways of shaping uh, preference, different mechanisms. And particularly as we go online and as we live online much more, um, I think many more of these mechanisms are going to become viable. And the nice thing about online is that it satisfies the taboo conditions. Uh, taboo conditions are local public goods. Where that is, you can move from world to world to world to world very easily at low cost online. So it's much uh, less costly to set up a new type of government. Uh, you know, every new blockchain project has got its own governance system. Most of them are terrible. Most of them are going to fail. Um, but when before in human history have we had as many experiments with governance mechanisms as we are today? It's really quite extraordinary. Like Tezos has got its mechanism and, you know, uh, Ethereum has got its mechanism. And so we're doing much more experimentation in how to organize collectively, right? Um, this is Glenn Wall and his radical exchange uh, uh, project. So the collective organization and is an unsolved problem, right? Uh, how do we act collectively to solve public good problems without becoming uh, dictatorial, without becoming, uh, you know, uh, with, without falling under rent seeking, you know, without falling under all of the problems of collective action, right? Uh, if we can crack that nut, that's a huge thing. And the plethora of online worlds and experiments is, I think, one way which we're going to do this. And it's, it's, it hasn't been done, right? The last time we did this was transitioning to democracy, uh, basically after World War II. You know, uh, uh, World War II, I think there was like, eight democracies in the world at the end of the world, at the end of the war, and now we have hundreds. So we've got many experiments in democracy. Some of them have worked well, some of them haven't. Um, but now with online worlds, we can have thousands of experiments uh, with new types of governance mechanisms. That's so fascinating. Uh, by the way, what do you think of Robin Hansen's idea of a future archy where prediction markets decide which policy right. to adopt? Right, so, uh, you know, Robin's idea is remarkable. Um, you know, I often, you know, tell my students, look, in the whole history of the world, okay, you can kind of say there's really only been like maybe four types of government. There's, you know, uh, there's the monarch, you know, the dictator, there's rule there's by the aristocrats, oligarchy, right, uh, and democracy. 
Um, so there was, Aristotle understood all three of those. Then you had like maybe kind of some uh, uh, Rothbardian uh, anarchism, okay? Rothbardian and uh, David Friedman style uh, anarchism. So that maybe made four kind of governance systems. And then Robin has his, a new one, which is incredibly <laughs> rare, right? So that makes five, which is futarchy. It's an entirely original uh, idea for governance by futurist markets. Um, and he's created a lot of uh, powerful arguments uh, in favor of it. So I am hugely, um, I'm a huge promoter of futarchy uh, to run experiments uh, with it. I would love to see many more experiments with uh, futarchy, with dominant assurance contracts, with kind of some of uh, Glenn Wall's radical exchange ideas. Um, you know, I want to see a lot more experimentation in these big ideas than we've had in the past. And online worlds may be one way of doing that. Well, can, can we consider your idea of dominant assurance contracts as a sixth form of government with like actual consent of the governed? Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. I wouldn't, I wouldn't quite put it up there with, you know, uh, monarchy or democracy, um, but it, it's a mechanism. It's a mechanism. I'm not sure I can run the whole government with dominant insurance contracts. Um, so uh, so I'm, I'm going to give Robin his, uh, his kudos <laughs> for uh, uh, creating the fifth, the fifth governance system. It's, uh, pretty, it's uh, pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so let me ask you about um, the, the different ways in which you've been creating content. So you write papers, you write books, uh, you've written a textbook with Tyler Cowen. Um, and of course, you did the online videos uh, with Marginal Revolution University. Which have you found to be the most effective way of com communicating information to your audience? Well, it's pretty amazing when I get emails from students like around the world from, you know, India and Pakistan and, you know, South Korea and so forth. And, you know, these uh, they say, you know, thank you, professor. You know, I was, I was able to pass my class because of you. And of course, I don't know who these people are, right? Um, but so it's amazing that I have students that I, I, I've never met. I never, probably never will meet. Um, sometimes when I do travel, I get to meet some of these students, which is great, right? So this idea that a teacher can, you know, teach thousands and hundreds of students, thousands of students, millions of students is pretty remarkable. Um, and I'll tell you kind of a secret, uh, Tyler, that, you know, between Tyler and I, our goal is to teach more people economics than anyone has ever taught in the entire history of the world. So we are right now, we're behind Adam Smith, okay? We're behind, <laughs> we're behind Marshall, okay? Um, we're behind Mill, and we're catching up to Mankiw, <laughs> okay? So I think we might overtake Mankiw. Um, which would make me very, very happy. Um, so, and that's like possible. It's, right. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but that's like, that's a conceivable dream that Tyler and I could teach more people economics than anybody else in the history of the entire world. That is actually possible. I don't know what's going to, I'm not saying it's going to happen, um, but we're climbing the ranks. Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, haven't we uh, have, have you not already done this? Because I don't know how many copies of The Wealth of Nations have sold and much less how many have been read. But like, right. I, I, I can imagine that Marshall Revolution University has had more views than uh, there have been reads of The Wealth of Nations. Wealth of Nations has been around for a while. It was pretty yeah. bestseller in its time. <laughs> um, so I think we have a while to catch up uh, with Adam Smith. Indeed, the world has, the world would do, <laughs> would do itself a favor by learning it's Adam Smith, which it still hasn't done. So Adam Smith still has some lessons to teach. Um, so we're catching up, but we're not there yet. Yeah, also lessons that can be learned through your videos as well though. Uh, True. Uh, True. Yeah, so, okay, so to close out this interview, which has been really fascinating. Um, oh, oh before, actually, before I ask the final question, I wanna ask, so you have all these ideas, uh, dominance insurance contracts, prizes for increasing innovation during uh, pandemics, uh, tons of other ideas, right? Uh, Variolation from Rob Hanson. Is it frustrating to be an economist and you're putting all these ideas out there, but like very few of them are adopted by the government and you know how useful they would be? Uh, how, what is it like to be an economist uh, putting out all these ideas out there? Yeah, it's frustrating at times for sure. Um, like I just said, you know, the world does not cut up with um, Adam Smith, um, let alone with dominant assurance contracts. Um, I do think that in economics, we are very fortunate that uh, the skills which we are taught as a profession 
are widely applicable to a, a large range of fields. They're very, they're very general and widely applicable to a large range of fields. And um, we do have credibility in uh, policy and with the administration. Um, so while I don't feel that, you know, uh, you know, I'm super listened to or whatever, um, but, I, you know, I found myself talking with people at the White House and the Council of Economic Advisors, me and Michael Kramer. Um, so I don't know, you know, Operation Warp Speed, I don't know how much they listened. Um, but uh, maybe it's, you know, in part being in Washington, um, I feel I'm certainly not, you know, uh, at the heart of things, but I, I, you, you do feel in Washington that you're sort of close to the uh, pedestals of power uh, in some ways. Um, you know, Coase said that, uh, that a, an economist could earn his entire lifetime uh, wages just by stopping one bad idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I guess I feel I've done that. And that's maybe that's, maybe that's enough to justify. I, I find that very comforting that uh, you're being consulted with because w w all I see is Paul Bromer just uh, getting incredibly upset at how, how little his advice is listened to. And then I feel bad that if other advice isn't listened to as well. No, I, I, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, Romer has been pounding on testing right from the beginning and he's been absolutely right. And it, it, yeah, I've been incredibly frustrated talking with people in Congress and they're just, and they're always like, well, nothing's going to happen in this bill, but maybe in the next bill, it's, I, I don't understand it. It does seem that um, uh, we, ha it, it does seem something is wrong, to be frank. It seems that something is wrong and um, I, we haven't solved that problem, but it, it, yeah, I hate to end on a, on a negative, <laughs> on, a, on a negative note, but uh, yeah, there's something wrong. Well, can you expand on that? Well, Look, um, this is a part of what, you know, Tyler called uh, state capacity libertarianism, okay? And what is that? This is something that I've written about. I didn't use that term, but um, I've talked a lot about is, look, I want a small government, but I want a government to be able to do what it's supposed to do at the time it's supposed to do it, okay? And even I was shocked, like the CDC, their entire reason to Athra, right? Their entire reason for existing is to stop a pandemic. And yet they completely failed. They botched the first test, okay? And then the FDA came in and said, oh, private companies, you cannot use your testing. You have to apply to us to do, you know, to get approval from us to do your test. And that slowed everything down at the beginning of the pandemic uh, until the virus got ahead of us, right? And it just seems like, you know, in the past, uh, the government might have been smaller, but it was able to do things, um, sometimes bad things for sure. But the way we ramped up for World War II, you know, um, is a remark was a remarkable uh, achievement. And it just seems that, and it's not all Trump's fault, okay? Uh, Trump is terrible, whatever, you know, you blame him as much as you want, okay? But you cannot blame the failures of the CDC and the FDA uh, all at Trump's doorstep you know, Congress has completely failed as well, right? Congress is the one supposed to be passing the law. Where's Congress's testing plan? Where is Congress's uh, vaccine plan? Why is it that the, the, the only good thing that has come out of the administration on the pandemic is Operation Warp Speed? You know, why didn't Congress do that? That's actually Congress's job, okay? So Congress has completely failed as well. And there's a lackadaisical uh, attitude. There's a complacent attitude, which given that some of them are getting the virus, I, I completely fail to understand, you know, uh, it, like Boris Johnson, you know, he actually got the damn thing. You'd think he would want to uh, solve this problem. <laughs> um, and so it, it seems that not only are we not getting the government that we paid for, right? We're getting less, okay? I at least want to get, you know, something for what, for what I pay for it. And, you know, a pandemic, um, assistance or pandemic, responding to a pandemic, responding to a war, um, they're high on my list. Like I'm worried now, like the way I would never was before that, you know, we would lose a war with China or something like that. Okay. Um, you know, that never even occurred to me that the United States, you know, the, the greatest military superpower in the history of the entire world, right? Um, the, by far the largest economy, highest per capita, you know, incomes and so forth. 
to think that we might, you know, lose a war, um, it, w it just never, it would never have occurred to me. But now I just think things are so dysfunctional that anything is possible. Um, and it, it's, well, I'm, I am worried. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm worried. And it's not just about the pandemic, but I think that is just the canary in the coal mine, which tells us that this government is not working and it's not all gonna be, uh, the danger is that with a Biden administration, you know, the liberals will be so happy that all thought of fundamental change will uh, end, which is what happened, for example, under Obama, you know, under Bush, there was a big anti-war effort, right? Okay, you know, big anti-war um, protests and movement. And Obama came into power and that all went away and the war kept going, right? So, you know, we're still in Afghanistan, we're still in Iraq, uh, still, you know, bombing uh, countries around the world. So the Obama did not solve the problem, but the protests went away. And if Biden is elected, that's not gonna solve the problem of complacency. That's not gonna solve the problem that the government is riven with uh, legalism and bureaucracy and inefficiency and slowness, um, but it may take some of the force for change, uh, take the wind out of the sails, and that is a, a concern. Wow, okay. What's the way we make our government more effective? Is there, is there, is there some solution? You, you know, I don't have a solution, but one thing which I think is going to be helpful is actually competition with other countries, uh, such as China and India. You know, like what really made us, why did we go to the moon, okay? We went to the moon because we were competing with the Soviet Union, because they kicked our butts by putting somebody into space and made us look like fools, uh, made us look like technological laggards. So we got our act together and we devoted a huge amount of money to innovation, right, to, to NASA, a huge amount of the budget, um, like 12% at, at the height, 12% of the US budget was going to NASA, which, you know, you can complain about whatever, okay, but it was going to innovation. So one of the things that I've said, you know, in my book, Launching the Innovation Renaissance, is what we have today is a warfare welfare state, okay? We do two things. We invest a lot in the military and we invest a lot in various forms of welfare by which I'm including, you know, Medicare and Medicaid and redistribution and, and whatever. And I'm not even gonna say that's bad or whatever, okay? But what I would like to see us be is an innovation state. And as the warfare and the welfare state have grown as a share of the budget, the innovation state has shrunk. So we're investing much less in research and development, federal dollars in research and development than, than we used to. Um, and I would like to see it to shift us away from warfare and welfare and towards innovation. And when we see China start to kick our butts, um, where China's developing new pharmaceuticals, China's developing more artificial intelligence, China's developing genetic engineering. Like, what are we going to do when the first Chinese with, you know, super IQs of, you know, 160 plus, you know, start marching out of their factories, okay? Um, you know, hopefully that will, will kick us into gear and right. we'll say, okay, we've got we've to, you know, respond. So, uh, you know, I'm not one, I, I'm much more about cooperation than I am about international competition. I don't think we're at war literally with other countries. I think our interests actually align. But in terms of um, igniting the passions of a nation towards innovation and away from complacency, competition in the sense of the Olympics, a good kind of competition, if we can right. keep it, if we can keep it to that kind of competition, and not to you know blowing each other up, um, that kind of competition I think would do uh, would do a lot of good uh, in reigniting America to become kind of a uh, the leading nation of the world, not just in terms of innovation, but also in terms of uh, freedom and liberty and you know uh, racial and sexual equality, uh, all of these things which in many respects, not, not all by any means, but in many respects we've led um, in the past. And uh, to kind of reignite that, you know, to say like, bring all people from Hong Kong, let's bring them to the United States. Right. Let's bring the Uyghurs to the United States, okay? Let us be that shining beacon on the hill. That's what I would like to see the United States be.
Yeah, yeah. I had the pleasure of interviewing Caleb Watney, which who made a similar point as you that the path dependence of technology is very important. And so it's important that it happens in free country. Uh, now that you mentioned uh, uh, launching the innovation renaissance, do you mind if I ask you a question about the book? <laughs> sure. I'm a, if your audience can take it, I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you, you explained that uh, both the supply of innovation in terms of global talent will be increased because of globalization and also the demand because we'll have a global market. Um, so then how, how do we explain the great stagnation which happened during the same period as yeah. the time of greatest globalization? Right. Yeah. So this, um, so, we, so all of these trends should be very, very positive, right? Um, because, you know, the way I like to put it is that uh, as China becomes richer, they're all going to be looking for a cure for cancer too, right? Okay. This is a problem which affects everybody. Um, and so you have a much larger market, a uh, much bigger R and D market. Um, and you already see in China, um, leading technologies at uh, Tencent and so forth, uh, uh, Baidu and things like that. So they're already investing a lot in these technologies, which are public goods. Uh, artificial intelligence is, an, is another one. So I think we have a lot to gain by this increased budget devoted to R&D. Um, what I didn't, what I, uh, didn't um, uh, realize, I suppose, is that there is this countervailing wind, which we now know from the Bloom and Van Rienen wor uh, uh, work, uh, we talked a little bit about earlier, that it does seem there were a bunch of low hanging fruit and we are having to devote more and more resources to get the same uh, output. Uh, now, whether that's a fundamental technological factor, whether it's a regulatory factor, um, whether that's a temporary factor in response to these quantum leaps in technology, like we got electricity, we got the internal com combustion engine and it takes 50 years to kind of grind everything out, we came out of them. Um, now we've got computers that'll take some time to do that. Maybe biology is the next one, or as I said, quantum computers, I don't know what it's gonna be. But there may be a next technology where, again, that gives us kind of a, a, a leap. Um, uh, who, who knows? What I can say is that the globalization has been good for um, research and development. Uh, we would have been much worse off if we didn't have that. Okay, good. Uh, and the final question, which I'll ask all my guests is, what advice would you give to a 20 year old? Or to yourself when you were 20 or just to a generic 20 year old? Yeah, well, I have a generic 20 year old. I got two of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, look, uh, the world is changing faster. Um, so probably my advice is becoming, you know, the advice of older people is becoming less useful <laughs> over time. You know, it's a, don't play those video games. And now like video games, you know, you can be, you know, you can earn a lot of money playing video games. Right. So I guess I got that one wrong. I should have told my <laughs> kids, you know, <laughs> learn how to play this video game and <laughs> be a sports star, be an esports star. Um, look, uh, the return to skill is going up. So um, education is, continues to be extremely important. Uh, get an education in a, uh, in a sector which is complementary to technology, okay? So you don't wanna be competing against technology. You wanna be racing with the machine uh, to use Eric uh, bringe uh, and uh, McAfee's uh, uh, term. You wanna be racing with the machine. So if you can get uh, educated in a sector like electrical engineering, uh, computer science, or e economics as well, but in, in a sector which is complementary to technology, data, um, data science. So if you're able to, like what is increasing in the world faster than data? So if you're able to analyze data, um, that is going to be a incredibly beneficial um, skill because that's, we're getting a lot more of it, right? And extracting meaning from data is very difficult. Um, and making it accessible to human beings. So if you have some skills uh, which come out of economics, you know, causal inference, but also out of uh, data science, machine learning, and so forth, if you have some skills to extract information from data, that's going to be very valuable uh, in the world going, going forward. So uh, it's not, these are the areas where I have some sort of expertise in. It's not all that. Um, you know, marketing is going to continue to be important, oddly enough, right? You would think that that's going to go, no, that's marketing, things like that is going to be important. Design, right? So what is Apple? Apple is just a great design company, right? Uh, just an absolutely fabulous uh, design company. So, and that's complementary to technology, right? So you want to take te technology and find a way 
of putting it in human hands, which is creates a delightful, satisfying experience, right? Uh, that's very airy fairy. And yet that's an incredibly valuable um, skill. So it's not just um, hard science, but if you have an artistic impulse, then I would say that's fine. That's also going to be valuable if you could combine it with a technological field, right? So an artistic impulse in design, um, that is going to take you much, much further than in like just poetry, let's say. Okay. Uh, so you want to combine these things. Hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, very good advice. Uh, and it, thank you so much for being on. It, it's, it's an incredible privilege to get to ask questions to somebody of your expertise. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Oh, great. Uh, great being here. And uh, you asked great uh, questions. So thank you very much. Thank you.